Hi everybody, I'm Mike from the Digital Media Lab. This is a live lecture from the four to seven class. We'll be discussing camera raw and bridge, a little bit of bridge. Talking to you guys about a workflow for how when I shoot, this is kind of the little steps I go through when I do it. Uh, you're welcome to work however you want. There are lots of ways of working. I'm gonna show you my way and uh, some of the different bars inside of Camera Raw. Let's get started. Oh, by the way, to get here, you need to go to the public server, public volume. Inside of the lab materials folder, you'll find a DIGM 2350. Inside of DIGM 2350, you'll find a folder called Lab 12D, inside of which you'll find all of these digital negative files or Camera Raw files. You'll need to copy those files and navigate to them inside a bridge in order to catch up to where you use what you see here. Let's get started. Okay, so the first thing I usually do inside of Camera Raw is I hit Command A, and then I right click the file, and then I usually label them with one of these colors. Um, I know it says select second approved to do. Those are pretty much arbitrary labels. You can actually go into preferences and change them, but I usually just use them for colors, and I'm just gonna go ahead and with all of them selected, which you can do by pressing Command, Control on a PC, A, right clicking any of those folder files and picking one of these colors. Because as I work, I usually uh, have trouble remembering which ones I edited. So as we go through, we're going to change the colors so that I can note, oh, I've done these or I have these yet to do. Oh, I forgot a step. Everybody go ahead and go to Adobe Bridge Preferences. The hot key of Command K. Uh, it starts with a general tab. A lot of you guys, I've noticed, um, like kind of different color set or different, um, I don't know, gray settings for inside of Photoshop. You can do the same with Bridge, and you can change some of your inner things. I would not change accent color. Um, this is the color that those guys are going to change. I would tend to leave that at default. You want a fairly minimal interface, and default's going to work with that. The one thing that I highly recommend that everybody changes is to go ahead and select double click edits in Camera Raw settings in Bridge. The reason for this is Camera Raw is essentially a plugin that sits on top of Photoshop. When you double click these files, it'll open up inside of Camera Raw. It's like its own little program that runs on top of Photoshop. And when you select this option, you can actually run the plugin inside a bridge, which frees up Photoshop to do whatever it wants. So it's kind of nice to just be able to work exclusively in bridge as opposed to having to go back to Photoshop. So that's a nice checkbox. The next thing that I want you guys to do is go to cache or cache. I don't know. And select automatically export cache to folders when possible. The reason for this is that whenever you open a folder for the first time, Camera Raw is going to generate thumbnails as well as all of the settings that you are going to create will be saved. Um, not all of the settings, but some of them. Mostly the thumbnails will be saved inside of, if you don't have this checked, it will automatically save it inside of this uh, default cache folder. But if you uh, export it to the folder, what it does is it exports those thumbnails to the folder that you're working in so that when you drag that folder to a new computer, everything will be there. Essentially, Bridge will run a little bit faster as you go between computers. So it's a nice thing to have. Um, and the next thing that you can consider, this is not, this is a very optional setting. Um, start Bridge at login. For this class, for your computers, I might recommend it as Bridge is pretty nice with working with all different kinds of formats and all the Adobe stuff. So it can be nice, but it can also be irritating if you end up not liking Bridge. But essentially, Bridge is very much like Preview inside of Apple, or I guess in PC it's called Explorer. So uh, different from the Internet Explorer which is essentially Bridge is kind of a replacement for those, and but more geared towards Adobe products. It will also, in uh, Windows, you'll be able to see the thumbnails for 
camera raw files where in Windows you can't see those without extra plugins or software and stuff, which is kind of nice. I tend to leave it unchecked just because I do all kinds of things, but I'll go ahead and click OK. The next step that I usually do is I will hit spacebar and I will run through my photos and look for any really bad photos that I can't fix in terms of exposure. So if the photo is just pure white or pure black, if I just really hosed the exposure in some way, if I can see that it's blurry, I will go ahead, oops, I forgot one thing. Let me reset. Let me just take a step back here. I have a reject file. I'll go ahead and use the left and right arrows inside a spacebar, and I'm looking for just way overexposed or blurry photos that I don't like, or if there's duplicate photos that are very similar, I might select one of the select one of the two. For example, let's see this one. Where is that guy? This photo. If I click, I can actually zoom in, and I'll notice that there's a bit of camera shake with this one. So I'm going to go ahead and press the delete key. I can select. I can. I can label any file as a reject. And I'm just going to go through here and look through the preview. Now, one thing to note about this preview is it's not the same as the actual photo. This is a preview, so it's not perfect in terms, especially of sharpness. You'll notice that when we open these files inside of the camera raw, it, the files are going to be a bit sharper and a bit more accurate towards, um, this is really just a, a fast preview and it's designed to be fast. Although sometimes it can be a little slow. I, I might also note that like I could look at this photo and this photo notice that they're pretty similar. Uh, I kind of like this angle a little bit less, so I'll go ahead and press delete to reject that one. And I might skim through all of these and decide, well, that's kind of a dumb photo, reject that one. and so on and so forth. Now I can't remember if by default, you can go ahead and hit spacebar again to leave that or escape to leave that mode. I can't remember if by default a bridge will show or hide rejected files, but you can hide them from la for later uh, by going to view and then deselecting or just, it's a toggle so you can show rejected files which will hide those guys. And if you ever want to go back to your rejected files, you can go to View, Show, Reject Files. So that's kind of a way of deleting files without actually deleting them. If you want to delete inside of a bridge, you press Command Delete, and that will physically move it to the trash. But sometimes it's easy to make a mistake, and there's nice, it's nice to have that reject option. Just It's just a label that you can show and hide. Also, when I'm going through my thumbnails, I may use that star rating. You can press Command 1 through 5, and if I have a few files that I particularly like, I might give those a 5 star, 4 or 3, depending on that. The name of the game is speed in this, so really just kind of got to go on your first instinct. Don't sit there and try to analyze the picture or really consider it. We are going to go back over again. You, you got to consider that you are going to go over these files yet again. So you don't really have to um, get everything perfect on that first run. It's mostly just to find the really bad files. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and select a group of these, a couple of rows, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10. I usually don't want to open too many files inside of Camera Raw all at once. It kind of depends on your computer, but sometimes this can really slow your computer down if you try to open two or 300 raw files all at once. So usually I do them in patches or ba uh, batches of uh, 10 to 15 or 20 or so. With a couple of those selected, by the way, you just click the first photo and then click Shift, hold down the Shift key, and then click um, wherever on the row you want. Don't uh, select the JPEG for now which is dim, uh, make sure demo one is not selected and you can hold down the command key and click to deselect or select add to your selection. Go ahead and double click any of those DNG files which will bring us into camera raw. <coughs> and 
Anybody have any questions about bridge or kind of how I do it? I don't want to get too much into photography. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this lecture, but we, you will in uh, 2352, the, the, one of the other classes in this lecture. So this is just a screenshot I took of um, inside of Photoshop, but I wanted to use it to just kind of illustrate the different areas that we're going to cover. So imagine as each one of these kind of being a block, we're going to start with the red bar at the top, which is essentially our toolbar, and then kind of work around clockwise, more or less. So starting with the toolbar, which is this guy up at the top. Um, I do want to note before I start to really dig into Camera Raw, if you learn nothing else from what I say here, remember this. Camera Raw is very good at editing a photo globally, which means I'm going to apply, which is really just a fancy way of saying, I'm going to fix the entire image as a whole. Whereas Photoshop is very good in terms of image editing editing little pieces like I could draw I mean I mean I could drop out you know a, a person's no I could edit a person's nose or fix parts of just under the eyes it's a lot harder you can do these things in Photoshop but here it's faster and it's easier it's also easier to fix white balance globally so we talk about globally or editing specifically um, that's what we mean and, and Camera Raw does have some options for editing very specific things, but I'm going to kind of ignore those as you can do them better in Photoshop. And it just helps this lecture be a little bit shorter and not such a massive information. Okay. I'm going to shrink this guy down just to hide, just because I need a little bit of room here. The zoom tool and the hand tool, you guys should be fairly familiar with. They work just like in Photoshop and Illustrator. Um, the hand tool, you can bring up temporarily, just like in Illustrator, by holding down the space bar. So whatever, if you have another tool selected and you're fairly zoomed in, you can hold down the space bar key and drag around. The next tool that I want to talk about is the crop tool. And uh, I'll go ahead and let's go ahead and crop this image. Now, one of the things that in cropping photography you need to understand is ratio or side to width to height ratio. When taking a photograph, they're usually, I want to say they're four by three. No, they're two to three. Yeah, they're two to three. Most cameras shoot at a two to, two to three ratio. And most prints are at a two to three ratio as well. So keep in mind that if you crop an image for print and you're gonna go say, go get it printed at Walmart and go get some six by fours. Well, if you imagine six by four as a fraction, that's three by two, you need to keep maintain that ratio. We can actually click and hold the crop tool and we can select two by three, which will not allow us to create anything we can crop the image, but we have to maintain that two to three ratio. We can see, we can select lots of other ratios, a one to one ratio, essentially a box. And if I go back to normal, it will allow me to do anything like that. Any kind of crop I want. Now this image was shot for a banner for Facebook. So I can actually, I actually do have quite a bit of room to crop the top and bottom off and have a fairly long image and not have to worry about uh, how it's going to be printed. So I'll go ahead and, uh, and when, when cropping, you usually want to get rid of anything that's ugly and distracting. So the ceiling is totally irrelevant and it's also kind of ugly and distracting to this image. So I probably want to crop it out quite a bit, if not all the way. The chairs at the bottom, largely irrelevant, so I can crop those off getting down to the things that are most important. Incidentally, if you don't see this um, rule of thirds overlay, oops, 
you can show it by clicking holding the crop tool and selecting show overlay. It's a toggle. So you can turn it off and on by selecting it. And it'll show your rule of thirds. Um, rule of thirds is a photography thing and don't want to get into that too much. You can ask me after class if you want to learn more. And I'll go ahead and select this. Whatever crop you guys feel like. Kind of getting rid of anything, rid of anything irrelevant. A little bit of the left, a little bit of the right side, as those aren't needed. A little bit off the bottom. I'll press return to commit that change. Now, whenever working inside of Camera Raw, we are working non-destructively. Just because I've cropped all of these pixels off doesn't mean I've deleted them. I can always go back to any of my crops by selecting the crop tool and voila. If I made some errors, if I needed a different ratio image, I can always come back to it and make changes as needed. I'll press return to commit that change. So I can always get back to my crop tool by pressing the C key or selecting it inside of there. Next to the crop tool, we have the straighten tool, which um, I'm going to select, let's see if I can find a, a image. Uh, this image is a little bit off. So with the straighten tool, what you do is typically you drag along straight lines in your image or images, or I should say lines that should be straight like your horizon. You could imagine if you were shooting a sunset and the sunset is slightly tilted, that might not be the best thing. So you can simply click and drag a line. I'll use in this photo, I'll use the top of the computers. And this image is actually fairly okay. Let me see if I can find a better example. I don't. All these images are fairly straight. Anyway, I'll grab my straighten tool and crop this guy. I think this guy's a little bit off. Clicking and dragging across those top of those monitors. Now, if you shot a building and it'll automatically create a crop that will straighten that image. If I press return, now my image is perfectly straight. Incidentally, I just I, I went ahead and selected uh, image 2190, 2179 uh, was slightly not straight. But anyway, it'll automatically create a crop. Now you can also do this vertically. So if you have a building or something that needs to be straight, you can also drag that straighten tool as a vertical line and it'll automatically create a crop just like before. Usually you use the horizontal because of horizons and things like that. Things just tend to be vertically. Uh, go ahead and select that first image. Let's go ahead and continue working with that guy. The next four tools, and let me see if uh, I'm having trouble zooming in. But anyway, um, the next four tools on here, I'm not actually going to get into. They're sort of similar to some of the tools in Photoshop. They're a little bit clunky in the way that they work but they will edit specific things. We talked about how Camera Raw is better at editing globally. These are tools for editing specifically and a little bit beyond the scope of this class, or this lecture, this demonstration. The next tool I want to cover is this eyedropper tool. It's the first eyedropper tool, hotkey of I. It is my favorite tool by far. It is the white eyedropper, oh, what is it called? white balance tool. And I'll press command plus to zoom in on my image a little bit, holding down the spacebar key to kind of drag around. What the, what the white balance tool does is it will take any black, gray, or white portion of your image and white balance your image automatically. You can select any three of these and it will work. Sometimes you need to click around a little bit to find a good white balance. And notice that my temperature is changing as I click around. Typically, you don't want to select shadow areas or areas where there's, you want things that the primary source of light, and what's the primary source of light in this image? Well, it's coming from the windows. So we want things that that light is hitting directly. This whiteboard actually works pretty well, but if I were to select this Apple computer, which is actually kind of in a bit of a shadow area, you'll notice that I get two different colors or two different white points 
from these areas. One being a little bit more yellow because shadows tend to be a little bit bluer. So you don't want to select shadows. There are all kinds of areas in this image, lots of gray points that will work. I actually find that either the whiteboard or this part of the screen works pretty well in this image. And you kind of click around until you find a good white point. For the most part, uh, the camera got the white point pretty close because it's a daylight shot, or at least I used sunlight to light this photo. So it, the camera got it pretty close to begin with. I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, the next tool is you have a preferences dialog box. You won't really need to worry about this too much. There are some settings you could change in here, but uh, for the most part, I don't think that you need to. You can rotate the image left and right. You can also mark this image for deletion. I'll go into that in a little bit later when we go into the other panels. Preview checkbox, very important because it's important to look at before and afters to make sure that you're not going too far with your changes. Even when working in Photoshop, it's always really, really good to show and hide layers or in Camera Raw to uncheck and check this preview box to make sure you haven't really overdone this image. The button next to that is simply a full screen mode button, has a hotkey of F. I use this all the time. In full screen mode, it will not very easily let you access other programs. That can be pretty annoying. But it's also nice to work in full screen mode because you usually like to see the image full screen. So there's that toggle. So getting into the next part, which is this block right here, I think in our doodad. So we covered that top red bar. Now we'll cover the histogram, which is that part in green. The histogram, while looking like a fairly complicated thing, is not so complicated. All the histogram is, is a bar chart of your image. Everybody's familiar with bar charts. You can imagine like a column. We could have, say, how, how frequently these kinds of images are posted on the internet, right? And we would have one column would be cats, and that column would be very high, right? And then we'd have dogs, and that column might be kind of medium, right? So that's a bar chart. Everybody knows what a bar chart is. This is a bar chart as well. Let me go ahead and accentuate this. This is a bar chart as well, except that we have 256 bars all in a row. They're all very tiny. Where the left side of the histogram, you see our dark tones. Pitch black is at zero. It's that very left option. In the middle, we start to see our neutral color, neutral tones, things that are close to gray-ish. And towards the top, we see our highlights and whites. So we can see in this image, our image is what? Fairly bright or fairly dark? It's kind of dark, right? Because we see a lot of that histogram, that big pillar, or that, that I guess, um, bell curve is towards the bottom of our image. So we can see that it's kind of dark, which might make sense if this were shot at night, but it wasn't shot at night. And we probably don't want our computer lab to look like a CD dive or something. We don't want it dark. Probably want it to look nice and bright. There are two buttons inside of the histogram. There are these pentagram icons up at the top left and right. They are the shadow and highlight clipping warnings. What is clipping? Does anybody know? Clipping is when we have an image, like a photograph, and we, when our highlights go to pure white, we have blown out or clipped the highlights. Likewise with shadows, if we make our image too dark, we make those pixels pure black. Whenever you have, I mean, you can imagine a pure black set of pixels, there's no detail there. There's no, in this case, there would be no um, 
if I, if I take my exposure too far down and I clip way into the shadows, wow, I really have to really, okay. There's not going to be any detail where we see those blue, those blue markings. Those pixels have gone to pure black. Likewise, if I turn on my highlight warnings, where's my highlight? Oh, they're on. And I take this image way too far up and way overexpose it, way over brighten it, we can see those areas in red we've overexposed. Those have become pure white. There's no detail there. Don't do this. Don't over, don't weigh. You can have a little bit of clipping in the shadows and highlights, but not much. Any questions about the toolbar, histogram, things like that? The histogram is not something that you are going to, it gives you information, but you, you get like just quick a quick uh, glance at your photo. You can kind of see at a glance that this image is too dark. Or you could see if your uh, bell curve is kind of on the top that it might have a lot of bright pixels, which might be okay depending on your image, depending on how you're creating that image might be okay. So the histogram tells you things, but not necessarily the everything. Let's get into the next section, which is um, the basic section, I guess. This is called basic. It's that bar, this bar to the left here. And the first thing is white balance. Now we've already set our white balance with the white balance tool. If I, if I go to my white balance tool, we're pressing the I key and I click around, you'll notice that as I select different areas of white and gray, that I'm going to change my white balance. Now, if I ever want to get back to the original white balance, I can always select as shot in this dialog box. Yeah. Thanks. Professor Z just turned off the lights. Okay, so we can always select as shot in this section. There are some other things. Um, auto auto will work on occasion, but not often. All of these settings actually come from camera settings, so you can actually, uh, if you knew that everything was daylight, you could select daylight, cloudy. More often than not, I stick with this white balance tool, unless that image just doesn't have any white gray or black points. Sometimes you come across an image that doesn't have those points and you just can't find one. Sometimes you have to go with auto or, or try and, and fix the white balance manually. And you can fix it manually. You can adjust your temperature and tent here. Temperature being pretty obviously, right? Blue to yellow. Tent being kind of green to magenta. I think that's magenta. And usually one thing that I like to do whenever shooting people Right quick, I'll just kind of go here. Let's go to Dr. Wait. Whenever I'm shooting people and I'm selecting a white balance, now I know that these walls in the background are pretty gray, and I've got a good white point here. I might select this option. I'm going to press the up arrow key to bump that white balance a little bit warmer. We tend to like warmer skin tones. Um, people don't look good if they're too blue. Uh, so bumping that up just a tad with the up arrow keys and you can always just double click any of these dialog boxes. incidentally will work that way and you can just bump it up just a touch and give them a little bit more warmth i'll go ahead and uh, go back and select those images that i had um anybody have any questions about white balance or the histogram Incidentally, the uh, clipping warning dialog boxes have a hotkey of O and U, I think. Yeah, O and U. And uh, it is a good idea to memorize the hotkeys because um, these warning dialog box can really get, uh, the warning, clipping warnings can really get annoying. So, it, but you, at the same time, you do want to see them a lot. So they're, they're a good thing to kind of have under your fingertips to kind of turn on and off to make sure that you're not clipping, but at the same time, you're not, getting really annoyed at these giant red blobs on your image. Okay, so for the next thing, everybody go ahead and click done at the bottom right. And Camera Raw can actually be applied to any 
file format, I think, that I can think of. Anything that, that Adobe supports, you can apply it to JPEGs. Usually we don't apply it to JPEGs, although sometimes you're in a pinch and, and you need something that will edit JPEGs quickly. JPEGs do not contain as much information. We talked about blowing out the shadows and the highlights. It will be much harder to recover highlight detail from a JPEG. Why? Because it's compressed. Because there's less data there. And likewise with the shadows. Very common problem is to have fairly dark shadows. Your images tend to look better if you pull some information out of those shadows. Can't do that as easily with a JPEG. In fact, it's almost impossible. Why? Because there's less data there, it's compressed. Go ahead and select demo1.jpg. You'll need to right click it and select open in camera raw. I went ahead and made this a grayscale JPEG just for file size issues and things like that. All this is is just a gradient from black to white. And we can see our histogram is pretty much flat because it's a gradient. We don't see any colors because it's a grayscale image. There is no R, G, and B like we did with the other one. But this is a good way of looking at some of the other settings inside of our basic tab. Now, let's start with exposure. And Adobe set these up in order that you should think of them, which is nice. So you usually want to start with exposure, and exposure and contrast are sledgehammers. They are the thing that you really hit your image with if you need to brighten or add contrast. We'll get into contrast in a second. And as I brighten my image with exposure, we notice that our histogram is getting put, the whole histogram is getting pushed to the top. So if we turn in our clipping warnings, we can see that we're starting to blow out these highlights up here. Any of these sliders can be reset to zero simply by double clicking them. So I'll double click my exposure to reset that back to normal. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my highlight clipping. Let's look at contrast. Again, contrast is a bit of a sledgehammer. It affects everything. Really will hit your image with quite a bit. Sometimes you need that. And as we crank our contrast all the way up, we notice that the top two ends of our histogram are going up. That is because contrast likes to take the highlights and push them brighter in your, in your darker things. So everything above midtones will get brighter and everything below your midtones will get darker. So what will it do to that histogram? It will push it, if we increase contrast, it will push it away. Conversely, if we decrease contrast, we will actually start to push pixels towards the center. I'll double click that guy to reset him to zero. And we're getting more into our more minute tools, things that we can select. As we kind of go down here, we're getting more and more specific. As we increase our highlight slider, notice that it only affects everything from one quarter tones up. We can see that in our histogram. We can also see it in the exposure there. We can decrease it and get some of our highlights back and kind of flatten out just that top area. Likewise with shadows, it's going to really affect everything from our three quarter tones down to our shadows. So if we need to brighten up our shadows as often we do, we can get some detail back from our shadows. Going down these options, we get more and more specific. Whites will only be the very, very top part of our histogram and image. So only those highlights are selected with whites. So only those very topmost highlights are selected with whites. They're very, very similar. More often than not, we need to kind of bring down our highlights, but this can make our image look very flat. So we increase our whites, and we'll see that in a second when we edit an image. I'll double click those sliders to reset them to zero. Black, very similar to um, shadows, except that it's only going to affect the very darkest shat parts of our shadows, not all of them. Clarity. 
Clarity is a very interesting tool. And what clarity is, is mid-tone contrast. We talked about contrast being a sledgehammer. Well, clarity is a chisel. So it's really only going to affect from our one quarter tones to our three quarter tones. And what does contrast do? It pushes those out. As we increase clarity, we're going to make the difference between our midtones here. We'll see that what it looks like in an image. We can also decrease clarity. Now let's see these in practice. I'll go ahead and click done. And go ahead and select a block of images here. Holding down the shift key to select multiple. It doesn't really matter how many select, just not all of them, as it will slow down your computer a bit. I'm going to scroll down and select. I kind of feel like working with an outdoor image. Here's one of our five stars. You'll notice that there is an auto button here. A lot of times you will think that um, auto is automatic. And it, it's not going to do everything for you. However, it does tend to give you a good place to start. So if I select auto with this image, let's see, let's see how it does. It's going to do well with outdoor images. Let's try an indoor image and I'll select auto. I'm on image uh, 2249 if you want to follow along with me. And I clicked auto. Incidentally, the hot key for auto is command U. And this actually gives us a pretty good place to start off with. It kind of has brought a lot of the details out of our shadows. Now our image is far, far too, it doesn't have enough contrast. So I'm going to beef up the contrast. Uh, I'm going to get my blacks down. Now one of the things that you can do if you don't like using these uh, clipping dialogs, is that when you select one of these sliders, and I haven't let go of the mouse button yet, and I hold down the Alt key, it will give me a clipping warning. So as I drag this down, I can start to see that I'm clipping, especially that bottom left area of my image. I don't want that. I could probably accept a little bit of that in the bottom left there. I'm going to go and press the I key to bring up my uh, white balance tool and try and get a good white balance. This is a strong reason why, now I want to be careful not to select anything in the shadows. It's a really good reason why we, um, oops, that's in the shadows. This image is looking a little bit crooked to me, so I'm going to press the A key for my straighten tool. And I'll click and drag a to across the top of that which will automatically crop it and straighten it for me. I'll push enter to straighten that out. I'm going to go ahead and play with these sliders a little bit. And I can always hold down the Alt key to make sure I'm not blowing out anything important. Now, a lot of times, if your light source is inside of your image, as so essentially the sunlight outside of these windows is my light source, it's not uncommon for that to get blown out. And that's usually okay. See you later. That's generally okay. We're probably not going to be able to get those highlights back, quite frankly. So you can kind of go back and forth and see what a good level is. I've taken too much from my shadows. Image is looking a little bit yellow. And this is a really strong case for why we calibrate our monitors. Um, especially with the white balance tool. We definitely want everybody's whites to be the same color and accurate. With all of these settings, exposure, contrast, highlight, shadows, all of those guys, it's just going to take practice to get used to them. And your homework is to practice. We'll get into that when we get finished. So let's talk about the next group of slider bars. We talked about clarity being mid-tone contrast. Now that isn't necessarily going to tell you exactly what it is. So you really need to kind of try it out on different images. It can make images look like they're very kind of grungy. It almost makes them look a little bit sharper in a sense. 
it's actually going to work pretty well on this image. It will also um, emphasize texture in your image. So as I increase clarity in this image, one of the things I'm going to be doing, and I'll zoom in by pressing the Z, Z key, is I'm going to be increasing the texture on the side of this monitor. So if it has any dust or anything like that, it's going to bring more of that noise or that dust out. One of the things you should note is generally when working on people, do not increase clarity. It looks bad. Case in point, if I do that to Dr. Waite, it generally does not look good. And I'll press the P key to kind of do before and after. Here's before, looking normal. Here's maximum clarity. Again, it brings out texture. We don't always want that with people. I'll hit escape to kind of cancel that change and get back to where it was. Um, with a lot of these indoor or outdoor, uh, outdoor images, it's going to work pretty well. So just keep that in mind. Um, don't rarely do you ever use 100 clarity. Um, you can also uh, decrease clarity, which sort of makes images look a little hazy. Um, rarely are you ever going to be on extremes with clarity. It really is too much when you use 100 or negative 100. Whenever working with contrast tools, please note that when you increase contrast, you also increase saturation. When you decrease contrast, you decrease saturation usually. That is the same for the contrast tool and the clarity tool, which is why the vibrance and saturation slider bars are underneath clarity. So as we increase clarity, we may also need to increase. Actually, with clarity, as you increase it, you tend to kind of need to add some saturation. I misspoke a little bit. Vibrance and saturation are both very, very similar. The difference is that vibrance tries to saturate or increase your colors more intelligently. So saturation is linear. It's just going to increase saturation no matter what. Whereas Vibrance is going to take a look at those colors and try to protect them, especially skin tones. It will not saturate skin tones as much. Be careful with applying too much saturation. It's easy to kind of fall in love with an image that's oversaturated. But as you can see here, as I saturate this, I end up bringing some odd yellow colors inside of this image. So be careful about that. You can actually do some kind of neat effects by increasing saturation and decreasing vibrance. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions about any of those slider bars inside of the basic tab? So working on this image, I would start with auto. Let's go ahead and decrease our blacks. Tends to not do so well with that. Not like, kind of probably want to bring down. Now this U University of Houston logo I want to kind of maintain so I can see that it's sort of in the highlights. So I want to decrease those highlights and maybe increase my whites a little bit. As I increase my contrast, I'm kind of oversaturating the image a tiny bit. So I need to be careful about that. I might grab my eyedropper tool and get a nice white point. And there we have it. Maybe increase clarity a little bit just to kind of bump that up. And then I might crop it as I see fit or straightening if I need to do that. If I hold on the shift key with the crop tool, of course, I can uh, crop, I can maintain proportions, things like that. Of course, this image was for the web, so I can kind of have fun with it. Usually you want to crop out things that are relevant or ugly, just kind of distractions that aren't important. The ceiling is ugly and primarily a distraction, so on most of these I would crop that out. This left wall is a bit of a distraction, so I might crop it in a little bit, but it's still kind of interesting, so not all of it.
Maybe a little bit of the right wall too. So I might crop it like that. The next thing I want to cover is the That's the adjustments that we just covered there. The um, where's the tabs? Oh, tabs. So I know it's a little bit hard to see, but we're going to cover these tabs that I have marked in kind of a light blue color. Come back. Oh, come on, tabs. That's weird. What did I just do? Oh, good luck. okay. Oh, and I changed the color. Oh, great. Blue. Okay, so this tab color like that, this area. Um, a lot of this stuff is a little bit beyond the scope of this demonstration, so I'm just gonna go over them pretty quickly. The tone curve works, uh, and these are all different tabs. The tone curve works for very much like curves inside of Photoshop. Pretty much all of these are, it's just kind of a different perspective on that. You can actually kind of go in here and change it exactly like curves inside of Photoshop. The details is a simple is essentially noise reduction and sharpening. We're actually going to get into these on Wednesday, so I'll cover that then. HSL grayscale, you can actually kind of manipulate colors on an individual level. So, for example, if I wanted to desaturate all of my purples or maybe get rid of this yellow cast up here, I could maybe desaturate that yellow. Of course, keep in mind that I'm desaturating all yellows in my image, so I might not want to go too far. There's also a pretty good tool for converting an image to grayscale. Whenever you check this box, it's going to change all of your options. So you can essentially select which colors you want to be what color shade of gray. There's an auto option for that. Split toning is um, for uh, sepia toned images. And as you kind of go down this list of tabs, it's like more and more special effects and things that are kind of, you kind of apply to images. Um, lens correction is for uh, fixing problems with very wide angle lenses, or sometimes very telephoto lenses can have problems, and this will fix it. I think I did shoot this with a very fairly um, wide angle lens, I think it was a 28 millimeter, so it does have a little bit of distortion, which if you check this box, you can see it will automatically correct based on the camera model and lens model and and uh, stuff like that so it does it does a pretty good job effects um, you can add grain and vin and vignetting camera calibration uh, generally don't need to worry about this too much you can do some special effects with this but generally I would not your cameras don't really need to be calibrated it's kind of a very advanced thing to calibrate your camera Presets allows you to save, load, and create presets. You can actually go on the web and say you wanted to copy that Instagram filter. What's an Instagram filter? Fernicia or something? I don't know. 12B? I don't know. They have weird names. But you could probably go online and find Instagram filters or settings inside of Camera Raw that would replicate all of those Instagram filters or whatever filters you want. There are all kinds of presets inside of here that you can go searching on the web for. And snapshots is just another way of kind of saving a preset. I don't, again, a little bit beyond the scope of this. <clears throat> and we'll talk about sharpening on Wednesday. So let's talk about the next bar, the next kind of area that I want to talk about and that will be nope not file area let's talk about saving options which is the bar at the bottom almost done you guys so this bar at the bottom you'll notice done cancel and open image now whenever working in camera raw we are not actually harming pixels, and everything kind of is applied in um, sort of in the in in camera raw, and those things aren't actually applied to the image, or I should say, um, those settings aren't actually saved. So as I change my settings or I change my exposure contrast to this particular image, 
none of that is actually saved until I click done. The reason why that's really important and this is another reason why we don't try to edit all of our images at once. We do occasionally want to click done. If it crashes, power goes out, what have you, you're going to lose all of that stuff that you've done if you don't click done. Another important thing is if you click cancel, it will cancel everything that you've done. So it's essentially like closing the document without saving it. Do not click cancel by accident. You will bang your head against a wall. It's terrible. I don't. I wish there was like a dialogue. There is no dialogue box, by the way, if you click cancel. It just cancels everything for you. Oh, fun. Um, the next option, so be really careful about that. Make sure you occasionally, uh, as you're working, go ahead and um, click done to kind of save what you're doing. That's another reason why I like to label my files with red and yellow or red, kind of any kind of color markers. Open image will open the image inside of Photoshop. So say if you wanted to go ahead and select one of these images and continue editing it inside of Photoshop, you can do that. The next guy is, it looks like a web link. And if you click it, it, give, it brings up your workflow options. Workflow options, when you, you can actually save directly out of Camera Raw, which is how you're going to do your homework, by the way. And those files that you save directly out of Camera Raw are determined by the settings inside of here. Now, these settings are actually kind of tricky because they save. Whenever working, in, whenever working inside of Camera Raw, always click that link and check what it's saving as before you click save image, which is the next option that I'm going to talk about. Because these will save between, so if I click OK, and let's say I saved a bunch of images off, which we're going to look at next, and I click done, and then let's say I, I, I come back to this, and I'm like, oh, I, I, originally maybe I saved all these images for the web, and I come back here and I want to export a bunch of images for print, and I just go ahead and go ahead and click save image, which we'll cover in a second, it's going to use all of those settings that I had in here before, which these are kind of uh, width and height of 1,000, 100 PPI. Those would be kind of website files. So always, always, always come in here and check and make sure that um, it's not going on. I don't want to get into all of these things, but you can change this. Um, there's a really important checkbox right here, don't enlarge. Don't enlarge, I mean it. Don't do it. Um, it's a good idea to have this checkbox checked just to be safe. Don't enlarge your images, you're degrading your images when you do it, okay? You can output for sharpening, screen referencing, you know, like your television or computer screen, glossy and matte paper. These are just kind of quick sharpening settings. We haven't talked about smart, <laughs> smart objects. We haven't talked about smart objects, but there is a checkbox here. Kind of note it for later. When we learn about smart objects, it's kind of nice to be able to do that. Um, color space. Remember what color space? What do we? What two color spaces do we use? Adobe RGB and sRGB. Those are the only two color spaces you should ever really bother with. Adobe RGB or sRGB, let's start with sRGB, is, stands for simplified RGB, which is a color space for web, for a website. And Adobe RGB is essentially for everything else. It's a larger color space. It's a slightly larger file. You won't really ever need a, a different bit depth of file. So all the other settings are, you can generally leave alone. Mostly, um, sometimes I, I, I will mess with this depending on what kind of file I want. And I'll click OK. Once we <clears throat> once we've set our workflow options, we're going to save our image. And whenever I click Save Image, it's going to bring this dialog box up. Now I could select Save in Same Location. 
And if I were if I were to do that, it would save a JPEG right next to my raw file, which gets really confusing. You usually want to save in a new location. Whenever you save in a new location, it will always create a folder inside of the folder that you select. In this case, if uh, and it will name that folder whatever your file ex or your whatever format you export as. So in this case, if I export these files as JPEGs, it will create a little folder called JPEGs and it will put all my JPEGs inside of that folder what, depending on where I select. So if I select camera raw, so save a new location, and I think by default it might have D and G, go ahead and select JPEG. You can export in any kind of format. D and G would be kind of redundant. Um, and I don't know why it gives you the option for uppercase and lowercase JPEG. It has something to do with some old legacy software that doesn't matter. So I don't care if it's uppercase or lowercase. You can select either one. Essentially, you're selecting a file format. You can select PSD or TIFF if you wanted to do that. For your homework, please select JPEG. Once you do select that, you can um, change. You can kind of uh, whether or not it keeps the metadata or not. Usually inside of your camera, you can put your name that gets attached to each photo that you take digitally. You can decide whether or not to keep that kind of information. Sometimes cameras will even have contact information or location information if they're real fancy. Remove location info. And then quality. So a number from 1 to 12. For your homework, uh, just set to high. Just leave, I think by default it's on high. And as soon as I click save, it will save the image. It will save the image that I have selected up at the top. I have only one image selected, so it's only going to save one JPEG. That's usually not what you want to do. So I will select that image, and then I'm going to press Command A to select all. There's also the select all button. Then I want to click save images. Double checking my settings, everything's okay. And then click save. Of course, what's going to happen to me now, I'm going to have two JPEGs. It'll rename files. And notice that at the bottom here, and I have a link to it, it will work in the background saving off these images. So I can actually continue to work while it's converting those files in the background for me. And these images aren't terribly big, so it will do that pretty quickly. Okay, does anybody have any questions about that? Any of the buttons there are saving images off? All right. The next bar, getting really close to being done, is this bar over here. You can select multiple images and edit them all at once. So if I knew that my lighting or my source of light was the same for all of these images, one thing I could do is I could go ahead and select the first one, drag down here until I know, because I know that these were all shot with the same light source. Actually, virtually all of these images were, yep, which is window light. And holding down the shift key, I'll, cl I'll click that guy. I'll go to grab my white balance tool and I'll click right here, which will now set the white balance for all of the images that I have selected. Likewise, if I know that the exposure and lighting are very, very similar for some images, like I see that I can see kind of from the thumbnails that these four guys are all pretty similar, I can go ahead and edit. Now, whatever I change here, notice that these guys are, have no values inside of them. Because that means that they are different between all of these images. As I change exposure, or what have you, it will assign this exposure value to all, in this case, four images that I have selected. So I could edit a large block of images as long as I knew that they were all kind of together at once. Typically, I will assign sharpening to a large amount of images as well as white balance. 
I usually don't go through and assign exposure and white point, I mean, exposure and, and highlights and shadows and all of those other sliders. It, it, sometimes if you have a photo shoot where everything was the same, like in a studio or every, the lighting was all really similar, that will work out, but not normally. I'm going to just return everybody back to default. One thing you can do while editing multiple photographs or having multiple is you can compress very important hotkey command and left and right arrow, which will cycle through the different images in your selection. Notice that there's a blue box around those images. As I press command and left arrow and right arrow, I can kind of go through and see each image. Command and left arrow is actually a really important hotkey because as I'm working through my images, speed is really important. So I almost invariably will have my hand on command left and right arrow. So I'll kind of fix my settings in here, get my white balance correct. I'll press command left arrow, and then I'll get this guy. And I'm just working really quickly here. I would actually probably spend, because it's really important to sort of learn all of these hotkeys. This guy's overexposed by quite a bit. holding down alt to kind of get my blacks down and then command a, a right arrow to kind of get to the next image. When I did this uh, essentially professionally, I would, um, I would only spend maybe a few seconds per image. So you can get really, really fast. And the only way to do that is to learn by practice.